So, so for a day now, we've been talking about madmen and mathmen. We've been talking about creativity and algorithms. We've been talking about creative directors who are afraid of being overwhelmed and data scientists who are afraid of being ignored. It's a very real and legitimate conflict. In another sense, however, I would argue that it's entirely bogus because we've left out the elephant in the room. We've left out the party that is the arbitrator of the value proposition. I am talking about consumers and the way in which consumers make decisions, which is the same way that a creative director makes a decision, that there is a golden gut, that we feel our way toward decisions. So on the larger scale, what I want to argue today is for a completely new way of looking at creativity. I want to talk about the notion that creativity is really ultimately, in the advertising sense, the ability to create emotional responses in the audience that are conducive to sales. Because we are in the field of commerce, and if you do not reach those people effectively who take in the advertising and who buy the products that allow your client companies to make money and prosper, then this is an entirely academic conversation. And this is not an academic conversation because lives, careers, success depends on the ability to get this right. And if you want to get it right, you have to go to emotions. So that's my context. What I want to do is set up a little bit of what we're really going to get into today. And uh, hopefully this is going to move. <laughs> it hasn't so far. One more time. Need a little bit of help. I don't seem to get my slides moving. What do I need to do? Oh, over there they are. OK, here they're not doing anything. OK. Um, Let's start with how big big data is, just for a second. Uh, pretty amazing statistics, since we had someone here from Facebook. Every, what is it, every hour, 10 million new photographs get uploaded on Facebook. Every hour. Let's take it back a few years, if we start looking at this data set. If we take it back to 1986, lo and behold, amazingly enough, 40% of all the computing power we had in the world still resided in pocket calculators. That's how far we traveled, but I want to give you how far we're also going to travel. Because the last item I have here is information captured by sensors. IBM has just been granted a patent to essentially digitize and therefore data size floors. That as you cross a room, they're going to be able to know where you are and capture that data. And I'm here to suggest that just possibly in the future, banner ads may not be on the internet, they may be on the floor that you are crossing over. That instead of clicking on something, your footprint may activate a banner ad, for instance. So the ways in which we're going to capture data are going to just keep opening up and multiplying. So yes, there's a lot of data, but that's really not what I'm here to speak about today. Because if we are not careful, big data can be incredibly small data. It can be colossal, but we can be on a little island missing most of what is going on. And that's what I want to alert you to in terms of the opportunities, the ways in which we can take big data and recognize that it can be big or small or even bigger if we take into account human nature, which means we have to take into account emotions. So the reason I launched my company in 1998 was for a simple reason. Someone at none other than IBM faxed over an article to me. You can tell it's an old story of fax. Faxed over to me an article from American Demographics talking about the breakthroughs in brain science and how people actually make decisions. And lo and behold, the statistic that got my attention, first and foremost, was the conservative. This is the conservative estimation that at least 95% of people's thought activity happens on a subconscious, intuitive basis. That reality changes everything because it makes us move away from a traditional paradigm that really started with Descartes' famous comment, I think, therefore I am. The realities I'm about to introduce to you is much more like I have sensory impressions, I have emotional response to those sensory impressions, which includes advertising, and then I make a decision, but very little of it is consciously derived, very little of it is actually a rational approach to decision making. So 95% of it is subconscious below the waterline. 
It's what we talk about when we're talking about emotions, because feelings is that which is consciously known, and very little is consciously known. Don't panic, this is the only slide that looks like this, but honest to God, we have three brains. Yes, in The Wizard of Oz, the scarecrow lovingly says, with the thoughts I'd be thinking, I could be another Lincoln if I only had a brain. Rest assured, even on a Tuesday morning after a lot of alcohol, you have still three brains. Sensory brain, 500 million years old. Emotional brain, 200 million years old. A rational brain, granted we have it, but it's only 100,000 years old. It does not have first mover advantage in terms of how we make decisions. And the reality is that everybody feels before they think because the emotional brain got there first. We feel five times more quickly. There is no such thing as objectivity. There's a wonderful quote from Clarence Darrow, the attorney who said, uh, I don't like spinach and I'm glad I don't because if I liked it, I'd eat it and I just hate it. I think that is the true voice of consumers. You can look high and low, day and night, you will not find a whole lot of rationality in the process. And in fact, it's not just that the emotional brain is older, it's also more densely wired. The reason I have the party chart to the right is because the emotional brain, get a load of this, the emotional brain sends 10 times as much data to the rational brain as the other way around. It is a trade imbalance. It's as if the emotional brain was China and the rational brain was Cuba. Play to the percentages. If you want your advertising to be effective, if you want to grow your business, you have to play to reality. Do not imagine you're going to change human nature. It is hardwired into existence. Instead, what you want to do is leverage it. And what the agency knows is important is indeed important. Sensory impressions, emotion response, that is the key, that is the coin to the realm. That's how these things really work. And that is why in London they have the IPA, the Institute of Practitioners of Advertising. And they have the largest database in the world because to win one of their advertising awards, you have to turn in the sales data. Not the awareness data. As I said yesterday in an off-site or one of the uh, sub-sessions, uh, you know, I can be aware of Hitler. I don't plan to buy from Hitler. I can't take awareness to the bank. What an agency has to be able to do is stopping power that is conducive to setting up consideration. Stopping power and consideration, not awareness. And so what they found at the IPA working from sales data is that a traditional copy test that gave you a favorable result, less predictive of success in the marketplace than if you'd never tested at all. Now, I think a lot of people in the room would say, yes, I'm in, <laughs> exactly. I suspected that all along. They verified it. And why do they believe it's the major shortcoming of all traditional testing? It leaves out the emotional component. As I am going through and clicking off the ratings, I exist in a rational, cognitively filtered world, which is entirely artificial. So, in summary, what I mean is we have to take a very different look at how we're going to understand what's working. We need to move away from a rational model. We are not so much Mr. Spock, even though the leading graduate programs would have insisted on this as recently as 10 years ago. We're a lot more like Homer. We make decisions out of altruism, greed, laziness, stupidity, all sorts of things that do not show up on a spreadsheet, things we may not confess to in a focus group, but they are absolutely true, and they are very human. And so what I want to do now is plunge into how do I understand that human emotional component? And that takes me to my specialty, which is facial coding. So this is how I think you can make big data even bigger and, more importantly, more effective. You have to be able to move beyond transactions and consumption. That's fine. But frankly, it's not just what people do, it's what they avoid doing. You have to be able to get the whole circumference of what's happening, and you have to recognize that there are positive and negative emotions, approach and avoid, and how do you bring people into the fold? That's what you have to do. So if I look forward at marketing in the future, based on the breakthroughs in brain science, what do I know? That traditional 20th century marketing, to my mind, not necessarily the agency's fault, very much on the client side, very much client-driven, I would argue, by and large, 
is a very rational approach. I got a product, here are my benefits, even if they're not differentiated, I'm gonna line them up and I'm gonna throw a lot of facts at you, or factoids at least, and it's informationally based. Well, in 1965, a very famous British philosopher by the name of Mick Jagger suggested that maybe we should do it a bit differently. Remember the line, more and more of this useless information supposed to fire my imagination. I can't get no satisfaction. The truth is that a New York Times Sunday edition has more information in it than someone in 17th century London took in in an entire lifetime. We have all the information we need. Will we like more satisfaction? I suspect so. Does it mean that we could move from talking points? Politicians have mastered those, but who believes in politicians? Move from talking points to feeling points. Do I engage you? Because engagement, emotional engagement, gives you recall, it gives you call to action, and it sets up the opportunity for generating and driving preference. And finally, what I'm gonna be talking about is not just being on message, which is very rational, it's about being on emotion. As I said, creativity going forward, can I create the right emotions in the consumer to be conducive to sales? So maybe it's a problem solution commercial. Maybe I want them to feel the pain so the gain of the solution is so much more valuable. But whatever it is, do I create those right emotions going forward? And facial coding gives you the opportunity to finally know that. You can't depend on people self-reporting. Well, guys admit they're afraid, almost never. Quite honestly, I've worked for NBA, program, NBA teams and others, and I've seen star athletes who feel a lot of fear. But a guy won't admit it in the locker room, but he'll show it on the court. So, faces. How powerful are faces? Here's the most famous face in Western civilization, Mona Lisa. I've shown you two which should give away the fact that something's up here, and it is. Because when I turn them upright, you can suddenly discover that the one on one side is kind of screwy. Now, the reason you couldn't pick it up so well a moment ago versus now is that we have a part of the brain that's devoted to reading other people's faces. It is eight times more sensitive than the part of the brain that reads objects for a very basic reason. Friend or foe is the most basic issue in life. As LBJ, since we happen to be here in Austin, as LBJ once said, if you can't walk into a room and know who's with you and who's against you, you ain't worth spit as a politician. As an advertiser, if you can't pull people off the fence and bring them your direction, then you're not succeeding. The face is a really powerful way to make this work. And as I'm gonna go on and talk about facial coding, we're gonna go to the video for a moment, because the video is gonna give you a sense of really what I'm talking about with the power of faces. So let's go to the video if we can. And indeed it is. And the reality of market research as traditionally done is rather absurd. It's really one big lie, you know, that I'm gonna show you something and then I'm gonna pay you some money and you're gonna say, is your baby cute? Oh yes, the baby is very cute indeed. And we all move on and we're none the wiser for it. What we do is we signal in our face what our true preference is, what our instincts, what our reactions is, basically what our gut impression is, and that can be quantified, and that can become part of the big data set. Person who originated this was none other than Charles Darwin. Darwin came to realize through his studies that even a person born blind emotes the same way as you or I. It's hardwired into the brain. A child by nine months of age, which should cover most of your target markets, even a child by nine months of age has all the core emotions on their face. It's also the only place in the body where the muscles attach right to the skin. We're talking about quick, real-time data. So if we're talking about advertising, where we have second by second of the TV spot unfolding, if we have something where they're looking at this, they're at the banner, we got a little window of time, we can capture what's going on. It's why, for instance, I've been on CNN and Fox and MSNBC looking at the presidential debates. It's why I've been on ESPN looking at Roger Clemens, who is very guilty of the steroid scandal. We do give this stuff away. A professor named Paul Ekman codified it into a system. I went to Paul in 1998. My book, Emotionomics, which you are, have, I believe, uh, was chosen by Ad Age as one of the top 10 must-read books of 2009. Even if you don't read the rest of the book, the foreword's by Sam Simon, the co-creator of The Simpsons. Sam can write. 
So read the forward, if nothing else, and then go on from there. Uh, Blink, this is the only research tool described in the book and for some 30 pages. Lie to me show, we are part of the Advertising Research Foundation's Neuromarketing Task Force, and this was chosen as the tool most likely to transform market research because it gets you the most intimate, accurate, scientific, but not invasive way to capture what engages people and what wins people over, what turns them on and wins them over. Let me give you an example of what I mean by being on emotion. So here we have, up top, a billboard. You've got the Coke distributor sitting in the diner, and he actually prefers Pepsi. He is dumping Pepsi into the Coke can while looking around to make sure his supervisor is not in the same diner. What you see with the reds and the oranges is hot spots. This is eye tracking. This tells you where people look longest and the largest volume of people looking there. And if I click through, it even shows you the order in which people typically took in the billboard. What I have down below is facial coding. We know, because both of these are on a split-second timing, we know that when people saw the logo on his uniform, that they predominantly felt surprise. And when they saw the switcheroo of the two colas, they enjoyed the joke. What I'm suggesting here is we have a very different way we can start to look at the real value proposition. For so long, we have gone from you know cost per thousand, CPM. I think we can graduate that into something that's more realistic. For one thing, we should take into probably, you know, what my friend uh, Jeff Bander at iTrack Shop now called Sticky calls uh, cost per view, meaning do they actually fixate and look at something? Or is it in the parts of this billboard where it's in black because no one really looked there? Notice, for instance, yes, the Pepsi in the lower right-hand corner of the billboard is looked at, but now let's move on to the next measure, which is, I think, could be cost per engagement, CPE. Because now you notice that the logo down in the lower right-hand corner got no emotional response. The two colas that are involved in the storyline, so to speak, of switching the colas, dumping one into the other, that does get emotional response, but the static logo in the right-hand corner does not. So we should move, I think, really from sheer, simply exposure, simply from awareness, which is cost per thousand. We should move on to whether I really truly see it, whether I actually feel it, and whether the emotions that I feel are on emotion or off emotion. That's where we can go in the future, thanks to technology and ways of, quite honestly, taking big data and humanizing big data and bringing it back to the ultimate arbitrator of value which is the consumer. Just to make sure you know this all correlates back to money, we just have an article in Quirks talking about the fact that the USA Today ad meter, when we looked at some Super Bowl TV spots, had basically, just like the IPA data, no correlation to sales, 0. 0.0003. With facial coding, we got to 0.6. Not perfect, but certainly a movement forward. Okay, I got about eight minutes left. There's a few other things I wanted to touch on. Where is this going? Because I want to talk about really big picture stuff. The breakthroughs in brain science have fundamentally reorganized, and I think for an agency point of view, confirmed how important storytelling is, how important visuals are, because in fact, one quarter of the brain devoted to processing visuals. Where we're at today in terms of bringing bring big data and research tools to bear, uh, going forward on consumers is as follows. Right now, what we've gotten to is, one more screen. We've gotten to the point already, you may have seen this in the news accounts, that we are to identity recognition, automatic identity recognition. You have instances where if you are female and you approach a billboard, it will activate and it will show you its contents because you are part of the target market. If I approach it, and I'm not part of the target market, that billboard will not actually disclose its contents. I can go to a kiosk, maybe one run by Kraft, for instance, and if they can tell that I'm Hispanic or Asian American and I'm this age and this gender, they might give me a different list of recipe items than they would otherwise. So you have the ability, based on just knowing gender, approximation of age, race, ethnicity, 
some way of beginning to target in and use big data and technology to be able to get a little bit richer read. But that's not where it's going to stop, because we're going to move on very quickly here to we have the nascent stages of automated facial coding. It's not very accurate yet. But we have the nascent stages of that. And over the next few years, we are going to be able to move that forward. So we're gonna, uh, just going to have identity recognition. We're going to have emotion recognition. And the ability to plug that in means that big data will be a lot more sensitive and a lot more vibrant in terms of making sure that you come back to the real base of everything, the consumer and the emotional connection. So we're going to have converging things. We've been talking about left brain and right brain. What have we left out in all of this? Well, the heart, actually. The heart of the matter, if trust is the emotion of business and contempt, quite honestly, it's opposite, you need to hit those right emotions going forward. So let me give you one last example before I close out. It's talking about how we can move to those things that are endearing and enduring. And that's personality, knowing how you're really going to reach that consumer and how you can move forward. So the problem we have right now, documented by lots of sources, and maybe it's too hard to read these from the back of the room, but essentially what they're saying to us is we don't have a very good read on consumers when it's all said and done. We're throwing psychographics at them, attitudinal studies, you know, all these various things, and we don't still really know who we've got. And we need a way forward. And I think there is a way forward. It's something that most people haven't heard of, but it's well known in psychology. It's the gold standard for at least 20 years now. And it's something called the big five factor, that there are certain enduring traits that people have that are pretty much standardized by the time we're somewhere between 18 and 22 years of age. It helps us predict attitudes, values, self-concepts, motivations. This is something that can really be strong going forward. Uh, it is something that, by the way, takes us past Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs has been academically discredited for a very long time. Uh, tell your HR departments about it. However, they're still running tests using Myers-Briggs. What does Myers-Briggs miss by having only four elements? And I don't mean to sound like I'm spinal tap or I've got 11 on my amp, but there is something missing here. And it is something that is a fifth element. As Napoleon said, probably while retreating from Russia, mud is the fifth element. What is that fifth element that Myers-Briggs leaves out? It is neuroticism. Myers-Briggs takes into account openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness. But neuroticism is 40% of human nature, 40%. So it's not just Woody Allen who suffers from neuroticism. We all do. The question is, how are you going to map in and understand what's going on with people? Because again, like guys in fear, most people probably won't raise their hand and say, yeah, me, mostly neurotic. But it's happening. It's still real. It's still out there. Uh, you could go through and look at states, by the way, and see which states tend high and low on certain traits, including neuroticism. We have the data. <laughs> Uh, I want to give you one example of trying to pull this down into how facial coding can help inform this. Uh, not only do we have an algorithm that links the traits to what emotional displays people show most often, we can also plug it into segmentation in a way that I think is actionable, whether it comes from us or some other vendor in the future, actionable to getting a richer, more intimate read on your consumer. So in this case, we are doing work for ConAgra. They were trying to arrest the decline in flour sales and wheat and bread, whole wheat, white bread. And they wanted to know how these segments reacted. And I'll just take you really quickly through the data. So let's start with the white breaders. Turned out they had two groups of white breaders. One were the people who are traditionalist. They liked white bread because it reminded them of childhood. What we discovered from watching these people with the video is that they indexed high on sadness. They found adult life not much fun, disappointing. So childhood was a lot more fun. And they remembered the white bread. And so sadness was the key to understanding what this group is about and how you're going to connect to them. I mentioned the IBM patent earlier. Well, lo and behold, Microsoft has now been submitted a patent to say, if we see what someone shows emotionally, we want to come back with an ad that shows an ad that has that same emotion in being prevalent. Because how people feel is how they feel. 
It's easier to sell people on themselves than imagine there's something different. Emotions are highly contagious. So that's one group. Another one is people basically are like my dad. They, they don't like food sensations. They want to eat really bland food. So they liked uh, white bread because it had no taste. They indexed high on disgust because disgust as an emotion is bad taste, bad smell. Now let's move on to the whole eaters. There are nutritionalists, those people who want to control what goes in their body. They're very concerned about fiber content, you know, taking care of themselves and so forth. They indexed high on anger because anger is an emotion. It's about I want to be in control of my destiny and I want to make progress. And finally, you have the essentialists, those people who liked whole wheat because of the taste of whole wheat, and they indexed high on happiness. So you could take each of these four segments. We were able to find an emotion that really defined that group. And once I know that emotion, that becomes my trigger, my platform, my ability to sell into these people using the other currency in life, which is not just money, but emotions, something we exchange, feel, reflect all the time. So in summary, you know, often in advertising, we're talking about that which is very ethereal and ephemeral and brief, which is emotions. They come and go. They do it quickly. But if you look at emotions long term for a pay dirt, if you're looking at emotions from a strategic sense, you're talking about personality traits. If we say someone's a hothead, well, guess what? They show anger all the time. And the other thing is people's value systems, because your values reflect who you are, and where you come from, and those are emotionally laden, because we cannot retreat from who we are. And so that is the deeper, richer pay dirt. Those are the opportunities. If we're going to talk about emotions and fully leveraging them, that's where we're going to go on a deeper sense. So last slide. What I'm suggesting is all of you are facial coders, and all of you can become better facial coders. What you want to create in the end is true smiles, where the muscle in the eye relaxes and you get the twinkle in the eye versus the fake smiles that we see far too often. As you might have guessed by now, as my time runs out, no one plays poker with me. And there are cases where my, there are cases where my wife will say to me, uh, please don't look in my face while we're having a conversation. <laughs> and, and, the, and the largest cosmic joke of all of this is, I don't know, I'm from Minnesota. Uh, we have Garrison Keillor, makes a lot of fun of Norwegian Americans, and he has a joke about the Norwegian American man who loved his wife so dearly that he very nearly told her so. <laughs> a and I happen to be Norwegian American, so it is a cosmic joke that I would be here talking to you today as an emotions expert, but I really believe that they are the key to being successful going forward, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs>